Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. I hope you can hear me well, and I hope all of you are comfortable wherever you are in the world. Um, today, I'm going to be presenting to you uh, a, to a topic entitled um, Crimin Criminals and Victims. So I'll just first be sharing with you my screen. Okay. So I, I hope you can see my screen already. Uh, Kirsten, can they see it already? Dr. Yes, um, but can okay. you please play... Um... Put it in our presentation. Okay, yeah. so there. Can you see it now? Okay. Better. Better. Okay. So we're going to be talking about the criminals and victims, the marked women. And this is basic in images. We're going to be talking about images in periodicals during specifically the American period. No. So uh, what are we going to be talking about today? So what we're going to be talking about are these things. So we're going to, I'm going to give you first a background of the study. Then I'll give you certain chunks of the presentation, the scene of the crime in periodicals, the rap sheet where the we profile the criminals and the victims, and then a summary, which I call the verdict. Appropriate, right? So before anything else, let's, I want everybody who's watching right now to have all of us to be on the same page. So let's start with the background of the study. As uh, you can see, this is actually a chapter in my dissertation that I, I, I finished in Cote d'Azur. And uh, the sources that I utilized were, pure, uh, were periodicals from 1898 to 1939. Um, and the methodology and database that I utilized was grounded theory, archival research, which came from, which were called from Spain, America, United States, and the Philippines, which basically gave me a corpus of about 28,000 images, text, illustrations, and photos no? from various periodicals. And I looked at it with the, with the lens of uh, historical feminist perspective, ish, uh, modernity, and of course, um, uh, called from just a bit no, off from Habermas's separate spheres ideology of public and private spheres, but with a twist utilizing Alan McKee's theory on it. Uh, this will be how we will be going about this. So when uh, what I'm going to be talking to you about now will be images of women in periodicals, specifically the criminals and the victims, because basically the chapters have different images about women coming from the suffragists, political, economic, social, cultural. And so this would actually be the last chapter of my dissertation. So let's dive in and let's go to the scene of the crime in periodicals. Okay. So as the Americans, oh, by the way, just a backgrounder as well. This was also a presentation that I already did in Berlin. And we already, it was, uh, and I published an article from this already. You know? So I'm sharing it with you. So every, um, as the, um, the Americans you know, took control of the city in the 1900s, they legitimized their occupation of the Philippines by stating its need to be tutored on how to govern oneself based on the ideas of American democracy. In this light, they created various propaganda to show the world that the country was in bad shape and that the Filipino race need a firm hand to guide them to deliverance, which the American people were supposedly willing and magnanimously enough willing to provide. No? So the newspapers of the time supported this American policy and feverishly wrote about the morals in the of the natives that were supposedly naturally deceitful and dishonest, and it pervaded in Manila. No? So in light of this, they took over the reforming of various structures that held the justice system in the city to school the supposedly childish, immoral people of Manila, a system similar in many respects to those in the United States, with some striking differences to customize it to the occupied city was established. Um, so six types of courts could be found in the capital. No? So let me see, why is it not? Uh -huh. I think, why is it not working? Okay, so there. Uh, my PowerPoint, sorry, I have to escape. Uh, I have to stop sharing. Something happened to my PowerPoint. There, okay, so there. So uh, the sources, no? So we're gonna be talking about the sources of this stories, no? So as six types of courts could be found in the capital. There was the native court, the routine court, the general inferior court, the inferior provost court, the superior court, and the military commission. So these six courts had jurisdiction all over Manila. And this is where the, the journalists would actually get their stories. No, uh, It was within these courts that they found the, the stories of gore and crime, which then found their way in the, first, uh, in the front pages of the newspapers. Um, 
aside from getting their stories no, from the courts, the reporters also got their stories from the police station. As you can see here, there's actually uh, an example of a Manila Times police court uh, vignette. No? You would always find this in the front page of Manila Times, especially in the early 1900s. Um, they were, as you can see, without any very creative, ano, they were unceremoniously titled Police Court News. No? And they were vignettes or snippets of various petty crimes around the city. And they were lit in like a grossly list. No? Somebody did murder, somebody did arsony, whatever, somebody got drunk, you know, all of these things. No? And um, um, uh, their stories were actually called but who gets gets admitted? My screen is is frozen. <laughs> Let me stop this first. Okay, I think something happens. So I'll just do this. Is it okay if this is okay? Can you see it this way? No, Kate, we can't see your presentation. We can't see it because it yeah, stops so every time somebody gets admitted. My 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 yeah. computer. So I so is it okay if we just do this so that I can just click on it? Is it okay? Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. So we won't have any more problems with that. Okay. So um, the other, um, among the many, uh, once in a while, reporters would actually uh, have uh, put tips and witnesses no, from those who were uh, there in the, the crime scene. And once in a while, out of sheer luck, reporters would find their stories. No? So among the many crimes that the, were done by women or done to women, the biggest three topics of interest were mostly written were about uh, rampant vice of gambling, the harrowing stories concerning slave trade, human trafficking and prostitution, and the tragic stories of those who decided to commit suicide. So these subjects would be written again and again from the 1900s until the 1930s. So let's delve a little bit deeper into those, I call it the big three, no? gambling, slave trade, and suicide. So let's first go to gambling. I usually tell this in my class, no, parang they would be so surprised when they would realize that a lot of those who were caught gambling were women during that time. No? So it was believed that the Filipinos' vice of choice during that time was gambling. Even Catherine Mayo, who was, a, who was definitely very anti-Filipino, no? but had glowing descriptions for the, the women in the country, pointed out that the main downfall was their addiction to the game of chance. Various representations of women enjoying a simple game of cards were illustrated as an accompanying cartoon for an editorial and at times would be on the cover of some magazines. There was a contestation of issues concerning crime, social classes, and the idea of equality in the face of lady justice, which when you think about it until present time remains a sore point. Even though gambling was done by those coming from both the upper and lower classes, because again, that's, that's something that people don't realize that there's always that, I know, I know, that it's just the lower classes. But the truth is the image of the gambler remained as the common tao, but the ones who actually did it were both coming from the middle class and the upper class. Iba lang yung scenario, iba lang yung lugar kung saan nila ginagawa. No? So if one were to look at the police court news available, there was a cornucopia of cases presented where women were caught gambling. And as you can even see here in this Philippine Free Press, right, the image of the woman is the common woman, no? the lower class. And uh, she was the main, ano, uh, tawag ito, yun yung vision niya, no? So, um, if one were to look at the police court, uh, if they were caught in the company of other women, or they would always be with some men, or it's a mixture of both, no? Some would even be described as carrying babies with them during litigation. There was even one case where not one or three or even 10, but 20 Filipina women who were charged for gambling at one time, no? And male chase Chinese operators were usually cited as the owners of gambling dens. But again, here's another twist to the agency aspect of women. No? But in several vignettes, some women were also mentioned as owners of the gambling houses. Until the 1930s, women would be connected to gambling, not just as players, but as head of the big crime organizations running several gambling joints all over the capital and suburbs that even extended as far as the northern provinces. So they were the boss. No? They were running the whole thing. No? And the games that they usually played were actually huweting. So nandun na yun dati pa. No? Various pronouncements against gambling were reported, but the issue 
uh, remained a problem even during the Commonwealth government, where rings, specifically those involved in wetting, continued uninterrupted in and around Manila. Gambling in Manila would remain as a social problem as gambling den operators and more powerful became richer and more powerful, gaining paid pr uh, protection from the powers that be, such as the municipal board and the police, because, well, they're the ones who will also uh, 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 which arrest them. No? So they have to always be uh, in contact with them. No? So it did not even help that the politicians themselves were part of the wider problem since they are gamblers themselves. And it has to be also pointed out that it's not just the politicians, but their wives were also gamblers. No? So we go to the next, um, the next of the big three, which was the slave trade, was the illicit traffic in girls. And there's a very interesting story here. No? The illicit trafficking of girls in Manila at the start of the 19th century was not carried on by huge operators, but was instigated by the parents themselves who bartered their children like chattel. These daughters were usually sold by their parents to pay debts that they did not have the capacity to repay or to create some income for themselves. In the whole scenario, these young girls were left powerless and victimized by both parent and the keeper, the, the person that they are sold to. No? So the usual, uh, the, 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 the usual girls that they love to, to trade, no? for lack of a better term, no? are young mestiza girls aged 16 years and below. They were the preferred choice specifically to the Chinese who were cited by the periodicals as the princi principal purchasers of these ladies since, since they were also known as the chief traffickers of women, knowing that they could easily dispose of such wares once they returned to China. The lightness in complexion of the girl being sold was a chief factor in the scaling of prices. The lighter the color, the higher the sum can be demanded, even more so if the girl had a beautiful face and beguiling eyes. It seemed that this form of barter was a custom that was already happening during the Spanish period and was carried on during the American occupation. And therefore, the code of morals and arguments in, in the, on indecency and barbarity had little effect on those who sold and negotiated it. Parang continuous lang naman eh. Continuation lang to of what was happening before, no? So most of the girls sold to Chinese traffickers came from the provinces looking for a job and a better life. Rather familiar stories, no? Even at present, no? Most of them were promised as job, a job as helpers with respectable families in Manila. Their fortune would change once they find out that positions for them could not be found once they reached the capital. And these stories usually were only reported once the parties were implicated by the Secret Service in Manila. No? So by the 1920s, there will be lesser news on parents selling their children to Chinese traffickers as new me newer methods were used to procure girls such as kidnapping and ab abduction. By this time, the proprietors of the roadhouses that were located in the red light districts, because the red light districts during that time were near Manila, no? may para Manila sa utak natin, but before it was in Pasay, no? Paranaque and Caloocan, would not even be China men, but actually women called Mama San. So even that was there before, no? Because you would see it in the periodicals, they would call these uh, procurers and these traffickers in the red light districts as Mama Sans. Due to the huge amount of money received the girl, by the girls involved in this trade, it was reported but that by 1935, there was a change in the story, no? that certain girls actually volunteered uh, to pursue this life without regret or compunction for the price of receiving fine clothes, easy cash, and a good time. These Manila college girls usually ended up as mistresses to rich married men who fre frequented the brothels that they worked in. Many, suggested were posit many suggestions were posited to solve this widespread increase in slave trade, human trafficking, and prostitution, but the problem was never solved. In fact, um, Paz Mendoza Guazon actually decided, because she was a doctor, right? and she was saying that we should just allow the red light district to happen, but we have to put it in one place so that we can also control the problems with diseases. But of course, everybody went against her. But the, the interesting thing about this, the medical, uh, the medical community actually supported her because she was coming from science, no? that the idea of controlling all the problems, the moral and um, tawag dito, health problems that came from the red light district. So it's a very interesting story. No? Okay. We now go to the last no, of the big three, which is suicide, no? what I did for love. That's my title for that, for the, for the simple reason that you'll find out no, as I go through it. No? The number of suicides for both men and women in the islands before 1920 was far from alarming. No? According to the 1920 census, they attributed this to the Christian character and simple nature of the Filipino. 
There were several reasons for the cause of suicide, but it was cited that the predominant case of female suicides were because of love. Yan, love di ba yan? So uh, there was a sudden increase in the number of articles written about suicide in the mid-1920s. A graphic article entitled Cause and Growth of Suicide in 1928 reported that even though there seemed to be an increase in the interest on the topic, the Philippines was still very fortunate to not be experiencing the same suicide problem while other countries are. Our suicide cases come only at long intervals, and when they do, they attract considerable attention because supposedly of their scarcity. The seeming scarcity of an already novel topic made it even more interesting to readers. In an article written by Rodrigo Lim, wrote, uh, he wrote the findings of, of the Supreme Court Justice Ignacio Villamor, who investigated the topic. And in his, in his findings, the cause of suicide in an order if importance and prevalence were one, disgust with life, two, jealousy, three, fear of social disapproval, four, disappointments, five, miseries, and six, vices. His conclusions were consistent with the cases that were reported to the police. And there were about 80 attempted suicides in Manila in 1926, and only one successful suicide was registered. 57 were attributed, uh, and 57 attributed their act to disgust with mundane existence. One intriguing twist in the story of suicide during this period of time no, was that according to the findings of Judge William Moore, 43 of the attempted suicides in 1926 were not committed by those coming from the lower classes, but were actually done by those who belonged to well-to-do families, four even coming from very, very wealthy parents. However, their stories remained hushed as they refused to talk to authorities and reporters, although it would later be learned that all of them attempted to take their lives due to disappointments in love. No? So it's always that, no? love. So most of the news and features on suicide had the same content. News reports retold the stories of a woman who took her life for love, while feature articles wrote about the numbers of suicide cases, the various cases for it, and the ways they attempted or successfully committed it. No? So the majority of the suicides committed by young women were done by poisoning, drowning, hanging, or strangulation, by firearms, and by cutting or piercing instruments. Many of the suicides committed were unsuccessful due to the various reasons, such as the ineffectiveness of the poison that they would choose, because they would usually choose Lysol, because there was already Lysol during that time, no? or tincture of iodine, or because they really planned it uh, they re for a rather badly planned scenario, such as a very interesting story where there was a 16-year-old who decided to leap into the Manila Bay, but there were actually 20 persons who were in a swimming party, so they were able to save her. No? So interesting stories, to interesting twist to this suicide stories. No? So even though the numbers of successful and unsuccessful suicides were committed by those from the upper class, those that would be reported in the news were suicides committed by women coming from the lower and middle classes. The stories of those from the upper class remained closed from the public and were never narrated in the newspapers and magazines. No? So let's now go to the topic no, of the rap sheet, no, the criminals and the victims. So we will profile them. No? Who are they? Where are they? they come from, et cetera, et cetera, no? their stories. No? So um, the 1920 census reported that most of the common crimes in the Philippines, let's go first on the record, no? what, what were on the record. So let's look at the 1920 census for this one. No? So the 1920 census reported that most common crimes in the Philippines could be uh, divided into three categories. The first one would be crimes against persons where the most common would be the most common would be patricide, murder, homicide and physical injuries. The second category would be crimes against property, no, with theft, robbery, estafa, arson and damage to property as the most common crimes. Crimes against chastity would be the third category where the most common crimes were adultery, rape and unchaste practices, abduction, seduction and corruption of minors, bigamy and public scandal. So the 1920 states, uh, census stated that um, uh, there were about 6,271 cases committed in 1912 alone and of these 573 were committed by women which gave a ratio that for every 100 persons accused, there were nine crimes committed by 
women as compared to the 91 that men did. No? So these, why am I talking about these numbers? Because these numbers clearly show that men predominated in all crimes with the exception of the crime of adultery, which because of its nature showed almost the same figures for both sexes. Manila also seemed to be the highest number no, for, of crimes where it was committed. So when you look at the numbers, it was easy to understand why it was rather hard to fathom an image of a woman as a criminal. Because no? during the time, the images of women that you would see in the newspapers would be suffragettes, co-eds, queens, beauty queens, no carnival queens. Um, but if you look, if you literally you know, go through the whole thing, you would notice that there's still that story of the woman that's on the darker side of the world. No? So, but it's very hard to fathom an image of that woman because a lot, as pointed out by the numbers, men perpetrated most of the crimes. In the same way that it was also easy to imagine an image of a woman as a victim of the crime since they usually were relegated as such and therefore seen as damsels in distress. No? Crime was perceived as masculine in nature while that of the victim was very feminine. Women were always perceived as the weaker sex as compared to those of the male considered as the stronger one. No? So it was worth noting that if one utilized this categorization to study the corpus of crimes done by women or crimes that victimized women in the periodicals, then the number of cases where women were criminals and where women were victims of crimes were almost about the same. No? It is not to say that this is according to the periodicals, okay? So it is not to say that women committed many crimes. That's not the point, no? Uh, it was already a given that men predominated in the perpetuation of the crimes, but in the search for the woman, because the goal for me when I was going through my dissertation is where was the woman no, during the time? And what were the images that were presented or, 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 and how was she represented, no? Um, where was the woman in the public sphere, no? And it was surprising to, 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 to see that her pristine image of the suffragist, the businesswoman, the career woman, the beauty queen, the co-ed, had a very shadowy counterpoint. And um, the shadowy figure is actually relegated as a skeleton in the closet, hidden no? within either vignettes written about criminal cases presented in court or crime scenes. And the number of crimes done by women victimizing fellow women was almost equivalent to the number of crimes done by men on women. Again, a very interesting thing, no? So there were even some crimes done by women to men, but it was very minimal compared to the crimes they did to their female brethren. So the crimes, uh, the crimes reported in the periodicals that were done by women were varied, no? But most of the crimes committed were assault, gambling, theft, disturbing the peace, having an unsanitary home. I found this very interesting because you have to remember that during that time, there were epidemics that were happening as well, right? So your house has to be clean. If your house isn't clean, and if, for example, the, the Secret Service actually sees that your the gutter is, there's water there, they'll actually take you in because your house is unsanitary because of the epidemic that was happening, the malaria, no, stuff like that. So... Um, um, disorderly conduct, murder, and vagrancy. So these women involved in these cat fights were usually portrayed in the periodicals as heathens, no, or compared to animals let loose. Uh, there would always be a lot of hair pulling. They would always describe that, no, teeth biting and nail scratching. At times, more masculine words were used to describe the women, such as lady boxers. The results of the fights would find women sporting eyes of various hues, legs and arms full of scratches, and very swollen faces. Their dresses would also be described no, as tattered and shredded, and it would even be written down that they would be presented to the court wearing the very same shredded garments as they were whisked straight from the scene of the fight to jail or to court to face their judgment. No? So on the other hand, the crimes reported in the public periodicals done by men to women were assault, murder, um, including attempted murder, kidnapping, including unlawful detention, vehicular accidents. I, I'll have a very interesting story about these vehicular accidents later. No? Um, theft, slave trade, uh, rape, including attempted rape and sexual harassment, desertion, and false pretenses. The crimes done by women may be considered as soft or less violent crimes as compared to the more aggressive ones done by the men. Even though women committed many crimes involving assault, the result was minor compared to the result of the assault done by men to women. So looking at the details of the news reports, there were some... Uh, okay, so that's it. No? So let's now go to the profiling no, of these women. 
Let me see. Let's go to this. No? So let's first go to the social and educational background. Because no? they would always talk about the social background. Where did these women come from? What were their educational backgrounds? No? So there were not many images of women criminals or victims for the matter during this time. But once in a while, you would see a mugshot like this. No? The extant images available correlated with the stereotypical ideas that society had as to what is a criminal, so as to what a criminal and a victim resembled. No? Most of the images were illustrations that could be found in editorial cartoons. The photographs available were shots of the criminal or the victim in a studio, and the images that aligned with pervading ideas of what a criminal and a victim looked like were the photo of mugshots, like this one that you will see here, used to accompany certain um, articles, or photos of victims in hospital beds. This few images hand in hand with the bits and pieces of information in the text as they were reported in various articles, supported the perception that most of those who committed crimes and were victimized by crimes were women coming from the lower classes, no? since it was pretty hard to find an upper class woman's mugshot in the periodicals. More women from the lower classes were brought to court. Um, let me just check you. Yeah, okay. Um, um, and more women from lower class brought to court, and those upper class women who were caught, for example, in gambling raids, as you can see here no, in this uh, Philippine pre Free Press uh, editorial cartoon. Now, if the lower class uh, women were actually arrested, parang walang pakialam, di ba? But sa, for those from the, coming from the upper class, parang nagpapaalam pa na pwede ba namin kayong arresto yan? Parang ganon, di ba? So, um, when poor women were caught gambling, they are placed under arrest and bundled, no? with scant ceremony and taken to the police station. And if they can't put up bail, many will actually spend the night there. Mayor Fernandez of Manila, now the mayor of uh, Manila during the time in an interview with a reporter admitted that when certain society dames were arrested for gambling, he had to give orders not to put them in a patrol wagon and that there was no need for them to appear at the police station. So if you, if your history 12 or history 166 teachers talk about the Ray Kwanli case, it, the Ray Kwanli case is actually connected to this, okay? I usually talk about this whole story and let it unfold. Kinikwento ko sila yung lahat ng nangyari. That's why tinamaan lahat, no? Mayor Fernandez, etc., etc. No? Okay. So the women did not even, no? especially this um, upper class women, did not even give their real names to the policemen as was required by the law. This type of favoritism was done by politicians like Mayor Fernandez because they needed the support and cooperation of the people in the upper classes. Not to mention that they were friends, compatriots, and fellow politicians, no? or wives of fellow politicians. No? Uh, it seemed that to be given to be a given that women coming from the middle and upper classes were supposedly more educated uh, than those coming from the lower classes. So they were expected to have, how do you say this, uh, more morals to not do this, but as, as, as can be seen from the, the news, and it's not necessarily true, no? Um, in fact, is it here? Let me see. In fact, the, the article by A.P. Laudico in graphic entitled College Bread Vic Convicts on Feb 16, 1933 discussed that there were a, quite a number of inmates uh, of the insular penitentiary and of the correctional institution for women who actually studied in ranking schools and universities in the ca capital, but their numbers failed in comparison to those inmates who were never able to study. No? So stories and articles about the upper class women were few and far between, but most cases were reported in periodicals were about the women from the lower classes who seemed to have a penchant for gambling, assault, fighting, de uh, theft, disturbing the peace and disorderly conduct. No? Um, and she, there was always this negative framing of a lower class woman who supposedly did not take care of her, of her home because she used most of her time gambling away the money that her husband gave to her, or she was busy fighting and creating disorder outside the house among her peers like a market monger because there will be a lot of stories about that, no? Middle and upper class, men were some, uh, upper class women were sometimes mentioned in a gambling case or two, um, but they would not even show up on the day of the trial since they had representatives and attorneys to protect them from the harsh judgment, not only of the court, but more so of society. Other crimes that uh, the upper and middle class women would find themselves would be in business negotiations and property settlements gone awry, you know, like embezzlements or theft and burglary cases where their money and jewels were stolen. 
So again, as Catherine Adams pointed out in her work, no, another uh, feminist historian, she's pointed out that the lower class women secured little, little representation on women's pages in magazines and guidebooks. And sadly, the little representation that she does get was less than stellar portrayals and mostly negative in nature, um, since they were typecast as irrational, historical, and violent. These stereotypical representations were oftentimes used to frame the dichotomies between a good and a bad woman, look, what a good and a bad woman looked like. No? And that main goal of those coming from the lower classes should be to aspire to be like those coming from the middle and upper classes. No? So even, even as victims of crimes, the image of the women from the lower classes were written in a very unflattering light, no? very, very, it's usually lurid, very vivid, very dirty, no, et cetera, et cetera, no. So the authorities and newspaper men cannot seem to get through, no, the blanket of in, the invisible blanket of power that the wealth and influence the women belonging to the upper class, uh, the upper class wielded. But once in a while, something really sensational comes up that wealth and power. And this happened with Estella Ramualdez, no? Okay. Um, this was what specifically happened to her, no? So she had a distinction of being the first woman to become private secretary to a Supreme Court justice, which was her uncle, Justice Norberto Ramualdez. She was the poster child of a perfect upper class woman until she was accused in 1926, 1926 of falsification of official and public documents. This showed that whether one came from the upper classes or the lower classes, and whether one was a criminal or a victim, the news pieces warned that the readers of a one the readers of a cautionary depiction of what any woman of any class would want to avoid, of the second degree of differentiation from the human norm. Not only are the article subjects not male and thus automatically the other, but they are not even women according to the definitions of womanhood perpetuated in daily discourse. No. So the, the case of Estella Rimualdez was an exception rather than a rule in the stories of justice. But then again, her power, her wealth, and influence was able to decrease her prison term to 10% of what she was supposed to serve. While the rich found ways out of the noose of justice, those who cannot buy their way out of the believed remained and virtually rotted in jail with no hope for pardon. Sadly, Lady Justice was not so blind. No? And the newspaper reports captured the images of this inequality. Even in the shadowy, shadowy representations of images of women, the upper class still received the story of redemption, while those from the lower classes were doomed to stay in their murky path of hopelessness and destruction. It was clear, even though this is not at the time of Ramon Magsaysay, no? but it's clear that Ramon Magsaysay's tenet here that those who have less in life should have more in law was an ideal that did not necessarily translate well in the face of reality. So that was the first profiling or the social and educational background. Now let's profile the civil status because it does affect the crimes no, that are done to women or how they were victimized. No? So during this period, actually applicable when you think about it no, nowadays, no? the supposed main goal of, well, to some, no? of the, ma the main goal of the female of the species during this time was to be a bride, then wife, then mother. As you can see in the representations in the advertisements, the stories, and even actually when you think about it, the pages that they were relegated to, which was about the home, right? Uh, so all the other causes were trumped by these goals, no? Sadly, most of the crimes that were committed to women were done in the process of pursuing these goals, no? Of being bride, wife, and mother. As stated in a police court vignette, it was a rare day when the judge was not called to settle matrimonial disputes, huh? So most of the crimes committed between husband, husbands and wives range from minor martial, mar marital fighting to bigamy, adultery, desertion, assault, battery, and murder. Most of the cases in the corpus were, that I have, no, where women were victimized by their husbands were on assault and battery charges. Once in a while, a wife meted out the same punishment to her husband, no? but this was an exception more than the rule. Small marital disputes, such as what happened to Senora Paula Camista and her good terms, no. Um, but again, this was another exception. More often than not, the cases reported, no, described the wife used as a punching bag, such as in the case of Pedro Alberto. The wives usually sported a couple of black eyes and some bruises in their faces and their body when they faced the judge. Others would have severe marks of violence on their faces and would even have bandages on their head. 
The husbands usually cited as their defense the woman's inability to properly conduct their wifely duties in the home, whether it be preparing tea or not giving him his slippers or not being able to prepare dinner when they got home. Most of the men who hit their wives were under the influence of alcohol. And there, there were even men, as, such as Miguel Sarmienta, who struck his wife, pulled her hair, and kicked her downstairs, who believed that his excuse for the violence was, was that she was simply his wife. That's legitimate na to do what he did, no? So aside from doing bodily harm to their wives with their bare hands, men also used tools to assault their better halves. Their favorite tools of assault were the bolo, the pocket knife, or the club. With bolos, knives, and clubs, the scenario became even more dangerous for women since most of the time the result of the fight would be murder. There were other cases where after the murder was committed, the murderer would then commit suicide and the bodies of the couple would be found together by the secret service. In the midst of all the marriage disputes and issues, the court would sometimes be the last recourse for women to air out their wo woes and to ask for a certain sense of justice in their lives. However, this would be even even be taken against them, as you will see here no, in this um, uh, editorial cartoon from The Independent, no, that they were saying that you keep your dirty clothes, dirty clothes sa bahay na lang, di ba? Na parang if there's a problem, keep it there. Don't bring it to the courts. No? So, but they were saying that this is the only recourse we have in order for us to get some justice, justice or at least some peace of mind, no? or, or actually to not be battered. No? So it was suggested that a very good possibility to lessen the violence between husbands and wives was to promulgate a better law on marriage. Okay? Again, a very interesting topic because this will actually affect the issues of marriage and divorce, which we do not have. No? Both parties should be given grounds to be able to separate ways once the marriage became untenable. In 1902, an op-ed piece was already written to suggest that a wise divorce law was badly needed so that women were not forced to stand ill treatment from their life partners, namely adultery, an attempt on the life of either partner by the other, desertion, and conviction of a crime that carries as a penalty imprisonment for a number of years. But since such law was not available, most of the married couples that decided to call it quits, that what they did was just they lived separately and found other partners while still being legally married to someone else. Hence the prevalence of bigamy, adultery, and assault. Without divorce as a possible exit strategy, sometimes the worst can happen as murder becomes the only viable exit. As the article that this came from you know, stated, queridas and illegal marriages, um, are at the bottom of one third of the cases that find their way into the police courts. And speaking of the querida, the word querida, when you look through the newspapers and the, the magazines, no, can be very tricky to understand. Because when one looked at the cases, no, because the word querida meant so many things. Sometimes it was used to connote the wife. And sometimes a lover, and sometimes a mistress, no? So it can be vexing and confusing, especially in the cases that were vaguely written. And a lot of them were vaguely written, no? But more often than not, the carida was the women pertained to as the mistress, no? So while all the crimes victimizing the married, while there were, these were all the crimes, no? Victimizing the married women, it seemed that the single woman was better off being single. Right, you think, no? But sadly, even the single ladies were ladies were not safe from the meanderings of wandering eyes of men, um, as they became victims of harassment, assault, kidnapping, abduction, and rape. These things usually happened when a courtship turned sour and the green-eyed monster reared its ugly head. Um, and just like the married men, no? single men also like using tools such as the club. And so when an affronted, jealous native man got angry, angry with the apple of his eye, he decided to club her because no? there were stories of that. Aside from harassment, no? and, um, aside from harassment and assault, a lot of the single women were being kidnapped, abducted, at times raped by their suitors or men who were very interested in them. From the hilarious to the downright, downright tragic, certain stories prove that truth can be stranger than fiction. And one of these truths stranger than fiction was this article that I found. No? I found it very interesting, no? in, in a way hilarious. No? It's a hilarious abduction story. Was when two maidens were abducted by a man on a carabao cart in daylight. Siyempre, nahabol siya, di ba? So, para sabi ko, I, I, I can't imagine why, no? So, the story of the thrilling rescue, no? From friends until the fight to the death between their brother and the vill villainous abductor was so melodramatic that even telenovela writers would think it was improbable. Because when I was reading this, I had to read it again. 
tama ba to? Totoo ba to? No? So parang, and some of the perpetrators of similar crimes to other women would be caught and brought to justice. But those who belong to well-to-do families had a strong pool of influential uh, friends were able to shorten again their sentences. This was what happened to, to, the, women, to the men like Bernardo Umali, Dr. Bustos, and Joaquin Marasigan, who were sentenced to 17 to 18 years in the Bilibid, but were able to grant exec but were granted executive clemency. Again, one of the other favorites that they liked to abduct was uh, the beauty queens, the carnival queens, specifically Miss Luzon. Because there would always, they would always even say that there's a Miss Luzon curse. Na parang pag nag Miss Luzon ka, matakot ka na, something might happen to you. No? So, stuff like that. So when all was said and done, whether married or single, or somewhere in between, the female of the species was, were, were easy prey to crimes done by the very person they were dreaming of meeting. The man of their, e their dreams easily became the man of their nightmares. As they say, the line between love and hate was a very thin one. And this thin line was crossed most of the time by the men who believed, whom women believed were their knights in shining armor. Sadly, both single and married women ended up as victims within, within this, uh, line, this thin line no, that was crossed. Okay, so we now go to age and physical appearance because again, this is part of the whole representation and images no, as the, period, the, 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 the journalists were writing about them no, on the newspapers. No? So most of the, mem the women who were reported to commit crimes such as gambling, assault, fighting, disorderly conduct, etc., etc., were described as old women coming from the lower classes. So you can really see you know, that there's really this whole stereotyping. No? They were simply characterized as old women in the reports. No? But there would be some writers who re reverted to the usage of metaphors and descriptions that were very derogatory. The judge handling their cases usually took the women's age into consideration, except when they became incorrigible and unbending, because there were some. No? If the old women were stereotyped as the ones most likely to commit a crime, it was the young girl who was usually reported as the victim of a crime. The young girl was usually victimized by the kidnappers, the abductors, the rapists, and traffickers. Okay, even though young girls were not usually pointed as to as culprits of crimes, the existence of the Philippine Training School for Girls was proof no, that, a, that young girls did commit offenses since the school was meant to be an institution in Manila to reform erring girls under the age of 18. So aside from the very clear description of age, reporters had a pension for describing the physical appearance of the marked woman. No? The writers had a pension for using dichotomies to emphasize extremes such as black and white, light and dark, young and old, and most of all, the eternal issue that haunts every woman of any age, ugly and beautiful. No? Stereotypical dichotomies were constantly used such as old crone for old women and youthful senora or senorita when the ladies involved were unequal in beauty and age. So if the ladies were of the same age, youth and beauty came into play, not just in the courtroom, but also in the newsroom. In a case where both women were beautiful, but the race was different, one can surmise that the lady with the lighter complexion will win. Maybe not all the time, but the image war on the newspaper, that is what, what happens, no? One case literally used the dichotomy of black and white to describe Remedias Pereya, who was a Filipina senorita with dark hair and dark eyes, eyes and Ms. Mrs. Parker, who was pronounced as an American blonde with golden hair, no? Of course, uh, Mrs. Parker won, no, in this um, case. And once in a while, Philippi pretty Filipinas and mestizos would be descri described with disparaging words as befits their action in the court, which would be described by the vignette writer as the vignette writer as scandalosa, no? a Spanish term that if used to describe any woman of pedigree would be humiliating, slanderous, and demeaning. But these instances were far and few between, no? far and few. No? The usual tendency would always be that a beautiful lady would be described in the most flattering of terms, and in fact, one there was one who possessed true beauty that the, if you read the, you know, the way that the, the journalist was writing, it was like he became a poet, no? describing the beauty of this woman on, in, in the court. No? So fortune favors the brave and the pretty on this aspect. No? One can only imagine the power of a woman in front of a court who had pedigree, youth, and beauty. It seemed that whether in real life, the court, or the newsroom, the one who has less in life, whether in social educational background, youth and beauty does not really have much in law or in media coverage. No? Okay, so we go to the last profiling. And I wrote this in because there really were certain things that the women was victimized or were, were, were committed crimes, but couldn't be put in one thing 
And the only reason why she was there was because, as a, crime, a criminal or a victim, was because she was a woman. So I co co coined it a sense of Eve. She's a woman. And that was it. No? So um, it was supposedly the fault of Eve no? that they were thrown, the way, parang we were thro that God threw away uh, men from paradise. No? She was the one who tempted Adam to eat the apple. And in line with this, women were not just victims or criminals. Sometimes they were supposedly at fault as to why the men committed the crime. They were the source or the reason of the crime. Like the stealing of a turkey, no? by as, like what you'll see here, like the stealing of a turkey by a certain Silvino Camido, which was the wish of his lady love for Christmas. Na huli siya, para sabi niya, but it was for my lady love. She's the reason why there was the crime. No? So these sample cases and more would be the reason why more often than not, Writers repeatedly blamed the women for crimes, even if it was, even if it was the man, man who committed it. No? And she didn't even really, because naliligaw pa lang naman to, di ba? Parang ganyan. So another fault of Eve was that she was not supposedly made in the image and likeness of God and was created from Adam's rib. Therefore, she was perceived as lesser than Adam. Using this premise, no? In uh, things big and small, men would almost always be considered as superior and better than the other half. If one were to use this thought as in an example, nowadays, there's a belief among, nowadays we, we hear this until now, no? that there's a belief among drivers, specifically men, that women are bad drivers. I'm pretty sure you've heard of this even now, right? No? This might not necessarily be true if we look at the statistics and the numbers, but as men kept on harping about this idea, they help in the continuation of the perpetuation of it. No? If one were to look at the articles no, during that time, um, of vehicular accidents and homicides from 1898 to 1938, one would actually think that women were even worse when it came to crossing the street. Since most of the news concerning vehicular accidents, whether it be kalesa, karomata, a lorry, a car, or an auto kalesa would have a woman as a victim in the middle of a crash, such as the Filipino cochero named Antero de la Cruz, who ran his rig against Manuela Ramos, which caused her death, no? So you would see all of these stories na parang, Hindi daw tayo mar the women don't know how to cross the street, so that's why they always ended up uh, in an accident or getting killed, no? So even senoritas that were inside the vehicles were not safe, as they were usually injured during crashes of two moving vehicles, such as what happened to Cocheros, Apolinario, and Rufino, who crashed into each other, no? In 1931, five girls were badly injured in various automobile accidents all over the city. Dolores Gooch, a five-year-old girl, was struck and killed by an auto kalesa. Faida de la Cruz, a centenarian, was run down and killed by a truck at the corner of Ascaraga and Evangelista. From Karomatas to cars, the women seem to be very unlucky with transport vehicles. No? If one were again to say that men drivers were better, all the deaths and injuries experienced by women while men were driving would be more than enough evidence to prove the contrary. But even the chief of police of Manila during the time was saying that if only women look at the roads, then they wouldn't be in an accident. Interesting, right? Perceptions that it was the woman's fault why she was victimized were rampant. So even though the man committed the crime, the woman was still to blame. At the end of the day, all fingers pointed the blame on the Eve because she committed the original sin. <laughs> so to finalize no, this whole presentation, Looking at the stories and images in periodicals, one can posit that justice was not so blind. No? It did treat classes, backgrounds, and appearances differently. If perceived from another perspective, one may also state that lady justice can be blind. No? But those who wrote and reported it about it did not necessarily abide by her sense of right and wrong because they needed to add color and drama to sell the news. No? There was still... Um, more men who committed crimes uh, in the newspapers, but there were also women, and they usually found themselves featured. No, the portrayal, but the portrayal was almost always negative. But once in a really long while, no, one gets to read a story about an exceptional woman in pr prison, and this is what I'm showing right now. No, this was the story of Gregoria Bernardino de la Cruz, and her story was that of a brave heroic woman who was a wife of a captain in the insurgent army involved in the rebellion of 1877 against the Spanish. A truly riveting and awe-inspiring story of a supposed criminal, but as was said, exceptional stories like this were very few and far between, and most of the images of women as criminals or victims were derogatory, negative, and frightening. Which goes to this one, no?
So even though there were women criminals and victims coming from the upper class who were highly educated, young, single, and beautiful, the profile of the marked woman, woman in the periodicals was still that of a dirty, unkempt, irrational, and educated old crone from the lower class who found laughter in the dark side of life. She was uncouth, and life seemed to have passed her by. That is why the story of Primitiva Marquez, who you will see here, was written as a cautionary tale to all women, especially girls in the provinces that dreamt of the gay life in Manila. She started out as a young girl, a uh, young 16-year-old provincial lass full of hopes and dreams for her future. But after 15 years of life in the streets and five convictions to her credit, she has become a woman who chose to stay in the Bilibid for six months instead of a three-month stay, which was she was being given a choice, no? A Bilibid prison for six months or three-month stay in a Manila convent. She actually decided to stay in Bilibid prison, no? So a veritable outcast, she has become an example of many women in Manila who represented the other aspect of the Manilenia, who, who preferred to live in the shadows and back alleys of the city. So I close my presentation on this one, and I hope you learned something new no? about the spirit of time and about the story of the women in periodicals. Okay, that's it. <laughs>